um, you know, time flies because I think it was 2013. <laughs> And actually, the Secretary of State involved was Justin Greening, indeed. Um, um, but you also missed one in the role of Secretary of State. So I think you probably tried to repress Priti Patel, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> only at your peril. Um, um, but basically, it's, uh, it's great to be able to, to talk. And it's talking uh, to some extent about my book. Uh, well, it is about the book I'll talk about, but also to some extent about you know, uh, and hopefully in Q&A, you can ask me whatever you want about um, the world of uh, policy making and advisory stuff, because I think I've been just very privileged in the last 10 years, which arguably partly were good times, partly were difficult times for anyone working in international development. Um, and, you know, the coming back under Dominic Raab and then being uh, presented with a fait accompli of Oh, and now why don't we cut your budget by um, a range of 30 to 60 percent, whatever the receiving end you are. So it's a very nice to, to be able to talk. So let, let me have a few slides about the book, but basically, and I'll try to go quite fast and, um, and, and let you then plenty of time for, for, for Q&A. Um, great, almost there. So um, here we are with the uh, with presentation. Um, I'm sure it's on the, yeah, it's coming here in the room as well. So, you know, the book, um, the book I'm presenting and that I'm actually can sell even at a discount here because actually all the bookshops in the neighborhood have no copies anymore. Uh, it's very clear. Um, the, is this, this is supply chain. That's another part of the crisis that we have to deal with. But basically, we have some copies here in the room and, of course, online available in all good bookshops. But clearly, because I understand Amazon bought most, bought mo most of the stock, definitely on Amazon and not so else. But anyway, a little bit about, you know, why, why am I doing this? You know, I'm an academic for the last 30 years doing research, as many of you in the room also will, will be involved in doing research, going into the field, talking to people, writing papers, and, and, and learning a lot of what's going on on, on the ground. Uh, we do also what, what I always enjoy doing is giving talks like I'm doing today. You, you talk a lot and you talk and you think you, you, you're influential because you talk to a lot of people and then you think there is something happening. The, I mean, the luck I've had is that, and it is now, uh, you know, it was in 20, uh, 2011, November 2011, that under Mitchell was Secretary of State, that I was selected to be the chief economist coming out of academia with no connections to the politics, no connections to the department. But it, it, it gave me a chance to do something that, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so glad looking back at it, I had a chance to, at a time when UK development was arguably on the rise and was, and was spreading out and, 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 and go very far, to actually really spend a lot of time in lots of countries. So in that period, I managed to spend, you know, weeks on end in different places, sometimes months on end from, from, from China to Peru, and to actually be there and, and, and engage with things. And yes, and of course, it also gets you in the room with, with uh, unlikely characters that I normally wouldn't have met you know, like the governor of the Central Bank of Uganda, uh, the vice president in, 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 uh, in Nigeria um, and, and in China. And I will say, you know, two out of these three were absolutely fascinating encounters. And I'll let you guess which was, was a bit more tricky. Um, but, uh, but you meet politicians, but you also meet technocrats and you can actually get a bit of a sense of doing it. Now, of course, you know so very well, this is a time where a lot has, has changed. And in recent times, this is from our world in data, I would say any source of data for presentation, they, 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 they clearly are the, are the best ones for that. But it's like, you know, in this kind of World Bank definition, which is a, an attempt to have some kind of an agreed comparable definition of the extent of extreme poverty across the world. It's not bad, it's not perfect, but it gives you as a pattern what's been happening since 1919. Of course, we, we know this whole story of a kind of a massive decline of extreme poverty. The dark red on the picture is essentially East Asia, mainly China then, where you start in China about seven, 800 million people below that line, probably 1990 to, to really low levels uh, by, by now. You also have South Asia, which is a slightly pink, pink thing. You know, the progress is there 
only really come quite a bit later, but definitely by the 2010s, we do think there's been quite a considerable decline in extreme poverty. And then the dark blue one is then essentially Africa, where it actually barely, and actually not quite, has been able to keep up with population. So that actually the number of, uh, of uh, okay, even though the, I, I should correct this actually, the poverty rate itself as a percentage of the population has gone down. So it's, but actually, if you think of it, the total number of people in this period is actually still going up a little bit uh, in, in that period. But so you get actually different stories of the developing world. And if there's ever is a period to say, look, there's a very different experience across the developing world, it will be then. But it actually goes further. And that actually was the thing that I thought we didn't tell the story of at all. And that actually once I spent a lot of time in all these different places, Often we specialize in one place, we know very well what's happening there, but not necessarily what happens elsewhere. But if you then start looking at comparatively, you know, there were, uh, you, know, you know, Africa has lots of different countries, some very small, but there were 18 countries with more than 8 million population uh, that had more than 20% extreme poverty by 1990. Actually, in this period, two of them actually managed to halve their poverty while others actually um, more than doubled the number of extreme poor. Now that's heterogeneity, that's a different pattern, that's a diverging trend within it. And then of course you get us the kind of countries where things, if anything, seem to be going backwards, while say, I would say Ghana, Ethiopia, at least from two of the large countries, at least in the extreme poverty in this period, there was quite a lot of progress. And so you get the usual suspect, but actually maybe not talked enough about the DRC, Ethiopia, Madagascar, but also some of these smaller countries where actually things are going differently. Now, my question that I wanted to start thinking about more is, is actually the, this heterogeneity experience. And actually, if we start looking at in GDP growth, we start getting actually countries that in this period did extremely well, while other countries actually were essentially stagnating. And this is within the same developing world. And there I say, often countries with comparable colonial histories as well to actually get that point also out of the way so that you actually start getting divergence where in this broader period since 1990 countries like indonesia and china indonesia already doing quite well by then but definitely china going quite far but but india vietnam doing quite well in gdp per capita nigeria only seem to be a moved up around 2003 or whatever because of the way you calculate it and actually stagnation broadly speaking in this whole period and then you get a Ghana as the Bangladesh uh, Ethiopia where something is happening where the DRC is considerably poorer now than it was in 1990 actually the statistics are even worse it's worse than it was in 1970 in, in its GDP per capita as well almost uniquely in the in the world so the question I want to deal with in the book it's not a, an academic book of original research and I'm going to do a massive cross-country growth regression or something like that. But actually, can I piece together from all the things, both what I know from academic work around some of these places, together with, um, with you know, the experience and being and the, and the conversations I was having all on the ground, piece together a story about you know, what, why this difference? What is behind some of these differences? So why do some countries make substantial progress and not others? So this is, this is actually asking ourselves is then, uh, you know, why is this happening? Even countries that by 1990 have actually quite similar characteristics and actually doing something, something there. So I'm not simply saying it all went wrong, wrong in 1870 or 1670 as some researchers would want to claim. No, no, you actually say similar situations and actually still divergence as recently as this. So when you start doing this, you ask yourself further. They see you me properly. Okay, good. Okay, so it's uh, apologies. Um, yes, um, and and so basically, you know, the first thing I did, and this is actually what uh, Cara was alluding to, which is actually something, you know, is a little bit of a Blue Peter moment. This is one I made earlier, uh, and in fact, I had constructed for for Justin Greening at the time this kind of lecture, which then later on I gave uh, here, uh, at least here in London, for the first time. Um, in, in, in London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, and then uh, later on actually in different places, you know, what is the dominant narrative about that tries to explain it? And if you go to these books, what does it tell you? Um, you know, these are essentially the best cells in economic development, not, and I want to emphasize, these are not necessarily 
the best books in development, but these are the ones that actually you would typically think in policy circles they may well have read. Uh, in fact, the whole story on Justin Green's encounter is, is very simply this. She came, uh, and the first chapter deals with this as well, she was appointed, she said some very uh, bad language to David Cameron, including, uh, I didn't go into politics to give money to poor people and wanted to reject the job, wasn't in a good mood when she reached the department. And our policy director, uh, we had picked that up because it was all splashed over the evening standard. Uh, we basically were ready and say, look, there's someone coming that doesn't want to be here. She doesn't know anything about development. What shall we do? She denies the story, by the way, and I want to put that clear before I'm sued. But, uh, but she denies the story, but at least the sources would tell us that it, that it was like that. But what the policy director then said to her, okay, why don't you this weekend read these books? These were these books. So basically, what then actually I said to her, and it was one of my better moments, why don't I give you a tutorial? And so actually had, and then now we'll actually want to be extremely positive about her. I had two sessions, two hour sessions, going through the difference between these books, actually more or less as it is now written up in the, in the book as well, a simple tutorial of what is the economics of the difference between different views of, of development and how, uh, and, and it was just amazing to teach her because she was a very receptive uh, student. Uh, she listened very carefully, and that's what politicians do best, link it back to stories she knew of, she wanted to check, including of her own childhood, being having coming from a family that worked in the mining industry, having to do what Norman Tebbit said everybody should do, get on their bike and move to the south. Basically, it's a family that moved to the south during the miners' strike to find employment. And so she was linking it to social mobility issues and entrapment, poverty, and all the kind of things. So anyway, these were these guys. I'm sure you knew exactly who they were. These were the books um, that we had. But one thing that these books often have in common, and I think these definitely do, is they tend to focus very much on what you should do. If you a little list, oh, this is the things you should do. These are the policies you should do, or this should be the, the list of prescriptions that you should do it. And they typically, their big competing diagnosis are on the one hand, it's basically, well, get your institutions right. You know, why nations fail? Uh, basically, it's all history. You know, your institutions in history were screwed up. Uh, basically, get yourself a better history because that's how you should develop. Uh, it's not a very practical piece of advice. And definitely the thing I learned working in practice is that say, well, you have to operate within the institutional landscape you have. And if you want change, you need to actually find it wherever you are then, rather than wishing that the perfect inclusive economic and political institutions are established. And so even though, yes, if you want to be Singapore, maybe you need this, but I'm not sure that actually we can offer Malawi a quick route into these perfect institutions. But furthermore, if you go to China, you know, China may have history of centralized state and taxation and all these things. But in 79, it was an absolute mess. As Yan Yang Ang very eloquently described, you know, the institutions were incredibly weak by then. And indeed, it was absolutely unclear even that that state would survive after cultural revolution and conflict. And the, the gang of four, Mao's death, and all the kinds of challenges they were faced with. So actually, by then, it was basically crumbling what actually these institutions were, and still they had to do it. And basically, in all the countries where you want to do this, and, and in fact, where you saw progress, Bangladesh, it doesn't have good institutions, I can assure you. It's a highly corrupt country with, with a, a political system that is evolving and evolving now again in a particular way. But meanwhile, it's one of these countries where surprisingly good outcomes uh, have been happening. Now you could say, oh, then it's all just about getting your policies right. Now, I don't believe the theory of the ignorance of political leaders everywhere in the world. I know a few that are quite ignorant, and I could name a few from further afield or nearby, but, um, but, but in general, the theory of ignorance, we just have to tell them what actually good policies are. I don't think that holds certain countries back relative to others. The ignorance explanation is not so helpful. So the question is then, why don't they? Why don't they actually adopt things that could actually help them with growth and development? And that's basically what I started encountering on my trips as well. This is actually probably 
where I really started realizing, no, this is clearly where some of the explanation has to come to. This is the prime minister's office in Kinshasa, in, in DRC. This is the label because I, could, I wasn't allowed to take a picture in Ethiopia of the prime minister's office, uh, uh, of the prime minister's office there. Within the scope of a couple of months, I was in very similar meetings, basically meetings of the technocrats where they were going to discuss all the things that we're going to do in development in the next five years. So there I was in Kinshasa. First of all, these guys were all, it was actually all guys. They're all in perfectly, impeccably dressed. They're all quite young. They were really sharp and they gave me the best plan that you could ever dream of that basically Washington would have been totally proud of uh, in every detail. And actually, as a researcher, I'd say, well, probably on balance, this makes a lot of sense. If you were to do this, you probably change dramatically the DRC. But I do remember walking out of the room and telling my colleague, wasn't this amazing theater? Because you knew full well that nothing and absolutely nothing would happen. Even though in another visit near, near, uh, soon afterwards, the prime minister hosted a, a, a pink champagne reception at the prime minister's office. He just knew nothing would happen. Meanwhile, in Ethiopia, we sit in the room and the ideas that they presented us were very ambitious, a little bit tricky. You know, my economic minds are saying, this, I can't see this working, you know, setting up a parastatal for this, this is all going to go wrong here for this, all kinds of things they were doing. But I do remember thinking, look, on the basis of their record, they will do it and they will broadly succeed. And if it doesn't, they will ask again, if we do this, what do you think will happen? And we had an incredibly productive meeting with people that were in the prime minister's office uh, and minister of finance and everybody was there. They were all high quality technocrats. And actually you kind of had a sense, oh yes, this will happen. It's not really right. And there will be all kinds of challenges in the economy and that economy when it was growing fast uh, in, in this period, it had all kinds of troubles. But it was, as the IMF said, between 2010 and 2019, the fastest growing economy in the world. And actually by, by doing this. So the question is a bit like, what's going on here? Well, first of all, and fundamentally, in one place, you know, there is absolutely zero commitment of those who have any power in that society, in that economy, in that politics to do anything. They have absolutely zero interest in doing it. While in Ethiopia, because of all the political reasons that we could talk afterwards more about it, but they had staked their legitimacy on actually being successful in growth and development. That was actually how they tried to get legitimacy within their imperfect state. Similarly, as in 1979, this was not like suddenly uh, the Communist Party of China and Deng Xiaoping discovering that all oh, capitalism like maybe we should have always been like that, but actually saying, no, at all costs, we should actually get this economy to grow because this is our only way to keep legitimacy in this country. And actually that legitimacy be seeking behavior was a quite essential part of that. And so that's where we begin to get at. Now, packing, unpacking this a bit deeper, one author that I really like in it, and, and I'm not quoting it for the books that he's most well known for, Douglas North and Wayne Gaston Wallace, who usually is seen as the one that, that, that gave the inspiration also to, to, the, to the why nations fail type of hypothesis, it's all institutions and history. He actually has a really interesting uh, 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 book and, and he's not the only one who's saying it, political scientists often say that. How do we think about, um, how do we think about the state? Uh, how do we think, think about a, a state? Well, you know, usually the best way of thinking about historically is that a bunch of people that are actually plundering the, the, the landscape actually say warlords or militias, whatever, more or less saying it makes sense to actually, if we, if we do this together, cooperative and not just fight each other, we can probably plunder even a bit more, we'll have more rents. And the whole idea of a state, and they call it a natural state, manages the problem of violence by basically having a coalition of forces that says, as Max Weber said, establish some form of monopoly of violence over a territory. And so that actually think about. Now, I think every state still has an element of this as being a coalition of power of an elite of those who actually have a say of influence. And I'm not simply saying developing countries as they were implying in their book. I think our state still has this sense of dominant coalitions for a particular direction of the country. Uh, and that is not just political, but also business and, and other interests as well. 
And so the way in the framework in the book I like to think about is to actually say, think of a state always as some form of lead bargain, sometimes very restricted, sometimes quite open, sometimes it's quite easy to enter, sometimes very hard. I can assure you there's no country where it's really easy to enter. Uh, in, and basically the elite are those with power and influence that could be from politics, from business, from the military, civil society, even academics, they could all be part of this. You know, um, they, they, they can have, uh, they, they, they can be in different places in different uh, coalitions. But basically, it's a lead bargain with those with power and influence, where at a minimum, it's about stability. But then actually, the rest is all a bit like the political deal of who actually controls power and an economic deal, who has access to resources, how do you get access to it? Uh, if I was rich in the 13th century, can I still be rich today with inheritance laws and any kind of elite bargain aspect that you may well want to have? And again, this is not simply oh, it's only in poor places like this. You know, our institutional setup around the politics and the economic deal, every time again, we get it reinterpreted, we may change it and so on, and uh, we have it there. So of course, something is historical there, but there's also something about the here and now. And it's mainly about that, that uh, here and now I want to talk about because these countries that in 1990 were successful, but not in 1947 or 1960, or indeed uh, much before, you know, what can actually explain what we can get? Now, we can have lots of different elite markets. We can have clientelism, as people say, where basically politics is all based to where you control the state to give jobs and resources to those who keep you in power. You could have patronage systems. You could have patrimonial states where it's a very small group of people. You could have kleptocracies where it's all about focused on a small group of people who use the state to steal. Well, you could also have all kinds of other states and variations of it. Well, if you want development, it definitely should have importantly the element in it that it actually wants to develop. That seems to be like a minimum kind of aspect that that elite bargain in the way the politics is set up, that they actually want growth and development. So, and, and I think that three things are required for what I then call a development bargain, an elite bargain for development. You want to be serious about peace and stability. I always uh, found it very striking that over the years, traveling a lot to Beijing, also being in meetings where senior Chinese officials would be, would be there, and they would always say the most important thing is peace and stability. Well, actually, they're right, you know, and that's actually something that was a defining feature in 79. We need to be able to keep peace and stability. So you need to have something there. Now it's a minimum required. You want to be serious about it in that elite market, okay? I'm not describing here the perfect state. I'm not making the case here of uh, what is the best thing for everybody, what is the most inclusive one. I want to describe what kind of states have actually developed. And there are obvious ones that I like more than others, but there are uh, things that are there. And I would actually say development here is also with a lot of the, um, you know, I don't want to just talk about growth. It is actually about spreading it quite broadly. But then you have two more characteristics, which is essentially to say the state, it's not about a big state or a small state. Use the state that is possible as it is possible in your own context. And that's the big contrast, for example, between Bangladesh and China. If you have 2,000 years of centralized taxation, centralized bureaucracy, relatively meritocratic appointments in bureaucracy, I'm not surprised you can use the state to do quite a lot of things. If you go to Bangladesh, where it's entirely clientelist, highly corrupt, very ineffective, coming out of conflict, incredibly young state with, no, with all the senior people were from the other side that was kicked out to West Pakistan, and so on and so on. You know, not surprising that they actually were successful by not using the state. And actually by self-aware that actually maybe we should leave space, as someone in the central bank said, we are the ultimate laissez-faire as it comes to the economy. And maybe that's an exaggeration, but definitely as an idea, look, that's the only way we can really do it because we can't let the state do it. And that includes then uniquely almost on the planet where they never really minded that aid was always used in the way the aid the donors wanted to, that national NGOs could be established and can actually become very powerful and only recently they get a bit more worried about them. BRAC, the largest NGO in the world, is there and more or less provided a lot of the social service to the poorest, but allowed to do it. 
if you think of the sums, I was talking to someone from BRAC a few days ago, and I need to do the calculation. They will celebrate 50 years of, uh, of, of BRAC. And I was, I'm going to go there for their celebrations. And I said, I need to have that statistics, how much money the UK will have put. But I think it is upwards of 700 million, million pounds that we've given to BRAC over the years. And it will probably be over a billion. Uh, you, it's probably more as well. So I, the numbers that I know, would, I would say there, but easily a billion of eight given to an NGO in a country, you know, Modi won't allow that, okay? Um, the, and, and basically you'll get that on the final thing that's very important. This is not about ideology and stick to ideas and stick to it. A plan that will never going to change our mind. It's basically, do you have systems that are willing to either tinker or do some correction, either politically or bureaucratic tinkering? You know, of course, you know, the Chinese, uh, the saying that Deng Xiaoping used, you know, uh, uh, crossing water by feeling for the stones. That idea, Yan Yan Ang wrote very eloquently about how China was doing this, but there's also in other places that you have space for some form of correction. Anyway, moving forward uh, in the interest of time, to just to keep in mind, I'm definitely not trying to say here, this has to be perfect. And they're definitely not going to be perfect institutions. That's not what we're going to have. This is also not something about the market versus the state. They're basically places where I think the state can do quite, quite a lot. I know lots of places where I wish that the state was trying to do less because it is not a capability in the way it's set up, the way the politics of the state works, the politics of the bureaucratic, bureaucratic politics work, do less. So this is not about, oh, we all have to have a development state. Definitely not. It also is not, when we look at development and growth, that we simply can say, as sometimes people try to argue, oh, it must be autocracy, you have to have a strong leader, or the reverse, you must have democracy. I tend to like democracy, but I can't say, clearly and honestly, that actually that's a necessary condition here for actually getting that takeoff, yeah? And I mean, importantly, it's a gamble. Think of what it is for that elite. You know, that elite that, that has power that needs to keep control. They are there in power. They can keep on doing what the often elites usually do, is distribute the wealth of the country amongst each other. Take Nigeria, you have about $500 per capita of natural resource rents, that come in every year. $500, over 200 million people. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the kind of number if we do it per capita. So if we were to do, as some people sometimes said, surely you should just do cash transfers of $500. Do you really think that the elite in Nigeria is going to do this? Of course not, because it's very simple. If we rather than divide amongst 200 million people, we divide amongst 200,000 people, we all have half a million dollars per capita. And I think I've more or less set, uh, defined the political and economic class, the leading class in Nigeria. It's no interest to do it. It would be an enormous gamble to trying to actually stop this, invest this prudently, and then later on becoming rich. That's a real gamble for an elite. So they won't do it easily. The political dynamics may change. There was all kinds of pressures there. And so that's why the title is there. And here, of course, naturally source rich country in this particular case, there was not willingness on the Kabila to do any of this. In Ethiopia, they did it, and as I already alluded to earlier, they needed legitimacy because actually in 2005, they had essentially lost the elections. They thought they could get it via the ballot box. They were looking and it was became a new strategy to actually get legitimacy to growth and development, thinking that the politics could be contained by having the economic strong. In China, it succeeded up to a point. Deng Xiaoping had to approve Tiananmen Square, uh, the troops coming there because the instability was there. The political deal was under threat, but they found to do it. In Ethiopia, all kinds of other things happened, attempts to open up, but it didn't keep the deal. So is there a development bargain or not? In the book, I talk about all these countries, bits and pieces and so on, storytelling. So you need to read more and you don't have to agree with the diagnosis there, but I try to talk about it a bit. I want to finish in a few minutes. What can outsiders do? And of course, some of you would say it's all sorted. In fact, in New York, they tell me it's all sorted. They've done the elite bargain for development. The MDGs in 2000, this is a picture of the Millennium Declaration. So why do we worry about that? They've already signed all up. All the elites of the world, all the leaders of the world have signed up as we keep on hearing it all the time uh, in 2000 for the Millennium Deve Development uh, Goals. And then of course, for the SDGs. They've all signed up. So sure, we can go home now because the elite bargain is being, being struck. Of course, the problem with an elite bargain 
is that it has to be credible. And there's very little credibility if you start looking at who was in this picture. I mean, actually, Vladimir is here. Uh, he signed the MDGs, and we're going to have a world without poverty, uh, he said. Uh, we have several people who were convicted uh, in the International Court of Justice for uh, Crimes Against Humanity. Uh, we have several other people that are investigated and sanctioned properly and truly because of corruption and all the kind of things. The problem with a declaration like this is, it's great for those who will do it anyway, and it's useless for those who have no incentive to actually do anything about it. And that's actually part of the problem, and it also leads to a bit of the, what the problem with aid can be. You know, signing up for this declaration is, I think, basically thinking that all the world dreams of being Sweden. No, a lot of people want to be Sweden. I'm sure they want to be Sweden, but they don't want to get there like Sweden did, uh, really very carefully and very transparently and openly and carefully investing in all kinds of things. It also leads to another thing about aid. Just as the SDGs really make sense for those who want to do it anywhere, but doesn't really add anything, broadly speaking, want to do it. And there's definitely lots of countries, and I would say increasing number of countries that actually try to actually develop in their, their, their societies and in, in at least in, these, in, in a lot of these spaces. But basically, if there is a development bargain, well, obviously, aid is, is, is a, is a no-brainer. They want the same that we do. The economist in the room, the principal agent problem is resolved. They have the same shared commitment, the shared, the shared objectives, provided at least if we still keep on giving aid for, okay, for reasonable good reasons, but that's another matter. <laughs> but if we are well, very willing, you know, then you could actually say, well, you want it, I want it, fine. I don't have to go to conditionality because they will do it anyway. There's no principal agent problem. It actually, it's there. They have the same objective function, broadly speaking. So I would say actually countries that are seem to be on the path of doing that, you should just be willing to be very, very generous. And I would say there's more and more of these countries in the world, you know, but that means in the spirit in Ethiopia, despite all, I would have been very much in favor of actually giving, giving more resources. Senegal, uh, Ghana, they could have used the resources very well, Cotivar as well. The opposite, if you don't think of where, for example, Ida, the, the World Bank's resources mainly went to, the, 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 the three top countries were DRC in the, uh, in the last, in the period, I think five years up to 2019, DRC, Nigeria, and Pakistan. Now, I wouldn't put them in the category here. These are the ones that, you, that you're there and say, okay, now, actually, if I was believed to say now the conversation is over, I never believed anyone there to be in the category of the real development bargain, but also then most of the country don't want it, we should stop that whole lot. It's, of course, a tricky one. And that I'll come then in a moment to some final uh, points. But in general, it's not just about AIDS. Although I know more about it because I seem to have been in that business for 10 years, I go at pains in the book to saying, no, no, we should also make sure that the incentives are set right for elite bargains that are for growth and development. For example, illicit finance, everybody always says, oh, it's all about tax revenue loss. No, 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 that's for us. In our countries where there is arguably a development bargain, broadly speaking, with some boundaries, it is there. That's all about tax receipts. I don't think I wanted to give a lot more money to Kabila. Okay, to be honest, I wasn't really inclined. Even if we knew it was illicit, I wouldn't have simply returned it to Kabila. So you actually start thinking more, but it's actually more, it's a mechanism of keeping power. It's the political financing is done, happens a lot through the illicit finance. Otherwise, you have to shift the incentives, much more incentives in favor of growth and development. For example, encourage exports. Why don't we subsidize imports from some of these countries, give them extra trade preferences of countries that really try to develop their export base? That would be a great idea. Um, and then finally, in all the places you work, you better understand what the politics is. And that basically means, you know, I'm in the end a technocrat, I'm an economist, but there's nothing of my advice that will ever have an impact unless I understand how it will actually work through that, that economy. So I'm not saying we all should just believe all the political science that's the only thing we should be doing. No, we could be still technical advisors, but we should be willing to, to listen to, to and understand better all these things. So if you're still keen to assist in the more difficult places, you know, well, the first 
I would say, if you see signs of the upside, that there is actually a chance that actually that commitment is there, they're really going to try to do something, be willing to gamble on them. But beware that it's not every, uh, everywhere. So the idea that you give, oh, we give simply eight money based on the number of people poor or eight money on GDP per capita as the World Bank allocation would happen, a lot of it is wasted. It's actually too naive about the way the politics is working. So I think you should always be thinking carefully and cautiously about what can you do? Are there maybe bits and pieces where you can start working with strengthening certain bureaucrats, certain bits in the economy and so on? And definitely no silver bullets and no magic beans. And it actually is to, to conclude. So as academics, as researchers, as technical advisors and experts, I think we'll just be far more effective by anywhere we work to really think, you know, is there actually here, is this a place where what I'm providing here, supporting here, researching here, and advice I give in a piece of research, is there really a chance here to actually making a big impact and what it would be? And actually just be, not be too naive that, that, that it will all the time be, be uh, successful and understand the politics and know about the entry points in it. In the last part of the book, I give a lot of details about you know, how aid could work and so on in these places, but I'm going to stop now. Thank you. I'll take my own questions. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll take first a few from the room and then hopefully people from the um, online, they can also type them in. Yes, please. Yeah, that's also true. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, I'll do a question from the room. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's actually quite a quite quite a quite a list potentially. I mean, you know the, you know. Uh, oh, I see. Yes. So it's a is the question is a bit uh, was about you know I emphasized peace and stability, and um, and on top of that, thinking about you know Ukraine and Russia. And uh, the question was said, you know, these days Russia, and you also said the West is not serious about peace and stability, but what are the opportunities and challenges for, for international development in, in that context? So that's a, so that's a really good, good question. And, and you know, something people forget, of course, that Ukraine is, a low, is, a, is actually um, a lower middle income country. Actually, it's, it's, it's a surprisingly low GDP per capita. What it is, it's of course in Europe and we suddenly uh, spent an awful lot of time about. But there's a couple of things that I already want to highlight here is that um, is the, is the, in the first instance that, you know, why there is uh, the conflict and so on, you know, the elite bargain in, in Russia has a particular set of features there as well. But we shouldn't forget on the Ukrainian side, and that's a, that's a tricky one to actually express, that um, before the conflict, this was the second most corrupt country in Europe, Belarus, although worse than Russia. You know, we, we're talking about also a society there that, 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 that we need to think about. And even if this conflict comes to an end, peace and stability will be a very important part of the nature of the economic deal we do, the way we actually will, will operate within that context. But moving a step away from the conflict itself. So I'm actually more want to imply, you know, don't think this is all going to be easy, even if it stabilizes again. This is actually going to be quite a complex place to get there. Of course, a real opportunity if we were to come out of conflict. But there's other parts of it as well. I would, for example, say on illicit finance, it's an incredible opportunity for international development. It's been very hard to actually push G7 countries ever to go to anything that even may or may not hit, uh, affect a small shopkeeper somewhere in a small village, somewhere in their countries, i.e. they could never have any downside from ever doing a sanction regime. We suddenly go for a sanction regime where we're willing to actually say, look, yes, this is 
um, in an economic parlance, this is not Pareto improvement. Not everybody will be made better off from these, from these sanctions. In fact, even people in our own country may well be made worse off and we'll actually do this and we can actually do this. Now that's an interesting precedent because it would give us the chance to really start thinking seriously about tax havens, uh, about illicit finance, about other measures, about you know, beneficial ownership, as indeed it suddenly happened that had been stuck forever. And not only can we now, if the law will properly come into force, know which, um, which Russian owns property in London, but we'll also know which Nigerian and which citizen of the DRC will have them as well. And so we can actually move forward. So these are the kind of things where you have the opportunities. I will be honest, I see a lot of downside as well, and that's the geopolitics. Geopolitics and development don't mix. People, practitioners in development, maybe even research and development, we've had it enormously good, and it will never be as good as it was recently for a while to come. And it's not about budgets. Between 20 and 2015, there was no real rivalry. The multipolarity was not really strong. Since 2015, of course, there was a bit of the, the worries that uh, the Western powers would have on China, but now geopolitics is back. We are back in doing potentially terrible things with policy making. Uh, because of the way the politics would go in, the, in developing countries as we were doing in the 1980s. That was a lost decade. We should just be very careful. So geopolitics is bad for development, you know, and we should just be aware that we need to rethink how that will be. So there's a big challenge there, but illicit finance and things like that, huge opportunity. Anything else in the room or is there anything on the, yes. Yes. So, excellent. Yes. So the question is really, and this is the question that anyone who's ever read the book has been asking me, uh, and it is a key question. I'll be the first one to to to, uh, to 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 acknowledge that. And the question is really, um, what are the signs or the predictors of a development bargain to be emerging? Okay. And so, um, well, on the one hand. Um, some of them will be probably some of the kind of the, the, the some of the elements that you can can well imagine uh, understand you know how institutions have been evolving and so on and in fact in a lot of the evolution of what's happening in countries Leonard Wanshakon you know the Princeton uh, political scientist but eco economist he says so it's about fifty percent is, is is history so there is something there so you look at that. But actually, the bigger, the, the more difficult question, which also institutional economists cannot really answer, why does it happen in 1960 and nine, not in 1975? Why does it happen in 1990 in some country and not there? And so therefore, you need to, it clearly has to be about data that tell us something about the particular circumstance. I don't think that we will soon have, and maybe some people will have, clear quantitative predictors in the statistical sense that we will do this because it will become interpretation of what are the windows of opportunities in a particular place because it is to do with and that's what I want to write in the book as well it's a lot to do about the agency of the elite players you know in a way and those who are a bit more technical I'm kind of thinking in a multiple equilibrium world you come out of conflict like Bangladesh in 1970 you have the worst 1970, sorry, 19, uh, independence, but it's 1972, I think. Uh, you have a famine straight after. Several years, you mess up the country further and total chaos. Now, you can go two directions, but the most likely one is further chaos. The best predictor of chaos is chaos. The best predictor of conflict is, is further conflict, of, of previous conflict. So you kind of really get into that. Somehow or another, by some configuration of bits and pieces that even people writing with huge knowledge institutionally about Bangladesh still argue over, but basically says, look, there's a number of factors. And that's in a way what I tried to capture. So there's something localized there. It is coming out of conflict, the need for, an, for a national narrative. It is probably to do with the politics as well and actually people giving up on the politics as well. It is somehow the, trans, the, the change of the elites and a new elite emerging. There's something to do with luck that Dayo came to do some uh, garment things that have failed, but then a lot of people started doing garment uh, manufacturing uh, and so on and so on. So there's a number of factors that exposed you can then say. And that's the biggest problem with a theory. This is also why I say this is not 
an academic book in itself, but actually that you, that you actually try to say, well, you need to see whether you have the sign. Now, acceleration of growth is probably one. And trying to be supportive if that growth is not from national resource, resources is to actually say the public investment and the quality of public investment probably is another one. Is actually say, oh, there's certain things to do it. But still, there will be nuance and understanding that you kind of need to, need to have. And this is probably what I'm appealed to, is to actually, wherever you work, wherever technical you are, and if you do, like me, my RCTs in places, I want to understand what the hell is going on in this place by being really knowledgeable about the place in general. Do we have anything online? Yeah, we've got uh, James Sharrock asked, um, are the implications of a political settlement approach for strategic Europe and the foreign Right. Um, right. Let me take that second one first. Um, when Jim Robinson was going around the world telling why nations fail, uh, he's a good friend. And I was very, I always have to think of that because it was during the Arab Spring. He had such a market for his book because of the Arab Spring, because everybody said, oh, now you just changed your institutions to do the big upheaval. I, I, already thought at the time hmm, will this you know i was working in different and we were already worried from day one where will this go and if you look back at it and saying you know yes some of you may want the big revolution the bigger people the big shock that is actually happening engineering the big shock regime change from outside hmm, probably not regime change from inside well if you're lucky it works but i probably probably too old and not necessarily wise, but, but uh, being less revolutionary in terms of thinking, you know, will we actually be able to do this? So does it lead me to say we the only way to get there is to working bits and pieces? I think as outsiders, that's probably what you can do. But I don't want to reduce it to kind of very small marginal incremental thing, you know, one, one, um, one technocrat at a time in a ministry and a one little bit of capacity building. No, no, you need to really spot much more carefully where the upside is very high. You know, in the book, I talk actually about a kind of a Warren Buffett model of development in investment, where you actually say you do it patiently, you invest in your team, but you clearly do something because you really think in the long run, this will have impact and you will actually do it. So you clearly look for the upside. So you take some risk there as well. The first thing is a bit like, he mentioned also the political settlements approach. And I would say, look, there's of course similarities to it and so on. I don't use that language because it confuses me. But there's one thing that I worry sometimes about political settlements. It gives the impression that there is always one equilibrium, that there is only one choice that people can make. That actually, and I, some good work is I'm sure done, the PhDs that I've examined always try to explain why one particular coup there, that was the only thing that could have happened in that country. It was obvious that that was the new, the new political settlement. I think there's much more agency. It's the same one out of the back. There's a, an insect flying around. Um, the, but there is agency here and choices that are being made. Uh, and and we, we, we need to have that space there. There is a space for not one leader, but some way or another, different people that actually strike uh, bargains with each other. Michelle Vigneri asks, uh, does your experience validate the idea that the countries that develop are those where those in power with access to resources invest right of all all sectors, help with the political crisis in Europe, or rather focus on natural resources and domestic resources? Uh, natural resources and the export sector. Yeah, no, no. So, so look, I, I, when I defined, you know, this is, this is the kind of thing where you make your own definition and I don't think anyone had called a development bargain, lead bargain for development this. I wanted to call it, make sure the word development was in there. So I'm not simply saying some kind of extractive model of a couple of industrial parks that are totally with no spillovers anywhere, or indeed natural resource GDP growth. I don't think that's, that's what I want to look at. I, I, I take the countries, and in fact, all these countries, why I like what's been happening in Ghana, is it's actually quite striking how broad it is. Now, the interesting thing is in Bangladesh, the case in point, 
it's not necessarily always the share of the budget goes equally to the different places. There's different bits and pieces that are possible, and, uh, but it is developmental in that sense. It, is, it has a focus on broader development outcomes. It has, and this is also why I show you a picture of extreme poverty, which is the criteria. I also use the lower end of the distribution and definitely not just GDP. Having said that, I find it hard to see of countries doing this successfully without keeping an eye out for tradable goods. If you have no natural resources, it's very hard to tie the hands of the elite unless you're willing to compete internationally. That's part of it as well in Bangladesh. They had to keep on being able to compete internationally. So they had to tie their hands to actually not start capturing more and more. Of course, Bangladesh has evolved and we could talk about another thing there because now it's the government exports that are in control of big parts of parliament, but that's a different story. This earlier period, that is actually was quite important for Bangladesh. It was crucially for Suharto in Indonesia that he opened up the economy for investments from Japan because the traditional class in the political settlement that we had didn't really want them to come and they were really opposing them. And so, but he allowed, to have to allow those people connected to the, to the big state or controlling uh, the oil to still be as corrupt as ever. And so it was a very interesting thing. Opening was allowed, but space had to be left for the other. So I can't see it as an economist without some tradables. Um, given how it becomes so much donor jargon, I don't understand the word governance anymore, first. I don't know anymore what people mean, because governance in the World Bank means everything that's not political, because they're not allowed to be political, as they like to say from their charter, so they call it governance. So if it is about technocratic governance, I don't think it's the answer. I think assessing how technocratically it's governed you need to understand what are the political incentives and why, why it is. What is the collective action problem underlying it in the political space? It means, and what, how is the link between the bureaucracy with the, the political powers? And what is the nature of the, of, of, of the things there? So these are symptoms and addressing symptoms will not get it. To be honest, that also means another anti-corruption commission is not going to do it. It's not going to do it. And we have good evidence that these things don't work. You may find ways of entry points, for example, by targeting right groups in the, in the civil service or something that may will want to be agents of change, but that's a different thing than saying, oh, well, we have the symptoms here, we're just going to address it, it's fine. That's, that's not the way. All these things have political layers and if the moment we uh, start acknowledging it, it will be better. So, so, so I, I, I actually just have spent a couple of weeks, not in Thailand, but with a Thailand expert in Cambodia. I had, no, 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 not a family planning, but I spent two weeks talking about Thailand. And in fact, because I know Ethiopia well, we have ended up all the time talking about it. Now, you know, just as things don't travel well from Westminster, say political systems don't travel well for Westminster in Malawi, just as banking models don't travel well from Beijing into Zambia, I don't think many policies travel very well. Thailand is a complicated place. And just the idea that because the, the, the only defining creature, or uh, sorry, the only defining feature of their political culture and the way the elite is operating in Thailand would, is, 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 for example, poverty, I think that would be very naive to actually reduce it to that. So I don't, I think it's a great idea that people exchange and try to learn lessons from each other, but to make it say, as long as it's out south, therefore a Brazilian in Malawi will do wonders and uh, someone from Ukraine in Malawi will make a mess of it. I don't believe it. 
But, you know, what I do like, and if maybe the question comes to there, if it's about a less powerful, uh, power-driven relationship, well, yes, why not? And then, of course, it can be, and I know from the Ethiopian side, not particularly on Thailand, but they clearly enjoyed when Indian experts were working in university and actually linking with them because they felt it was less threatening. And uh, compared to, you know, they, they didn't have a four wheel drive to drive around. Okay, that's basically, and I think any advisor that has a four wheel drive probably is not very well expressing the power relationship uh, with the people, uh, people working in government, unless of course they have a four wheel drive too. So, you know, um, in, in Whitehall in general, yes. So, so you know, I, in the last few days, I've had uh, lots of little talks uh, in FCDO as well as kind of the end thing. And of course, that same question is being asked there as well. What hope is there uh, for it? You know, the way I would look at it is probably um, um, to, let me see whether, uh, let me trick, trick, quickly mark, try to make three points. So the, so the first one is, is that, um, you know, clearly this is, this is a policy space in transition. You know, let's say um, you, you can definitely have a sense, the political, the political space in general is in transition in the UK. The, lots to do with internal reasons, also to do with external reasons as well. So you have a transition. So the first advice I've always been telling people also inside the system, you know, things can change very rapidly, you know? And so in terms of hope, you know, if there's a good probability chance that something will change, and I don't mean necessarily political change in party politics change, but actually just stabilizing it and actually rediscovering that space to think about what is development within the offer that the UK did, and it used to have a strong one as well. So the, the, the other one, of course, is that geopolitics is changing everything. So again, the question often that people ask is, you know, can we go back? And the implicit idea is, can't we go back to where we were? No, we won't go back to where we were. It will always now look different. And that's internationally. The board of the World Bank is as a result in a mess. The IMF is in a mess. The UN is in a mess because geopolitics really makes the operation of these systems really hard. But then the third thing I would say, you know, a smart person operating the space from outside from inside always finds windows of opportunity. And there always will be, you know, the teams that are smiling walking around in Whitehall happen to be the ones that work on education. Because actually, well, within all the, the things that there is, there is a window. I tell them, look, everybody is expecting you to now be the most successful team and do really proper development because you have the space to do it. And they have the space, they have the budget and the space to do it. And they even have diplomats that in principle should be able to help them. So it's saying it, but of course, those people working health and saying, we used to be in that space <laughs> and so on, it may not be the same, but that's basically it. The window, things will change over these 10 years that I've hung around in Whitehall, things changed all the time. And you just have to adapt and then seeing, try to keep the things and other things and try to improve. But the one thing is clear, this has to be a time of innovation, international development globally, because geopolitics will make a mess of it. And that's not just anything to do with budgets in the UK. And I don't know where that will go, but we'll have to find new ways to do that. Good. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we've got a few questions Yes. Okay, well, thank you for the, on those online. I will say thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.